In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome back, my brothers and sisters, to our study of the book of Ezekiel. We are walking through each chapter, really looking at the narrative in this study. And so our journey takes us today to Ezekiel chapter 6. And just to retrack and cover a little bit of history, you might remember from the previous videos that Ezekiel was taken into exile with a number of priests and with the king in 597 BC. So they were, and they, they were taken into Babylon. They lived about a hundred miles south of Babylon on a river channel just off of the Euphrates River called the Chabar River. So after being in exile for five years, Ezekiel began to receive his prophetic visions. And so this would be about 592 BC. And so Ezekiel begins to prophesy what will occur in the immediate future and how Jerusalem will be destroyed. And Jerusalem will be destroyed five years later, approximately, in 587 or 586 BC, depending on what commentaries you read. So let's pick up in chapter 6. And in this video, I want to talk about the concept of judgment and salvation. And you're going to be amazed when you read through this chapter. And at the very end, we're going to go back and look at the concept of judgment and salvation in the book of Exodus. And you'll get a little bit better idea of what Ezekiel is saying. And as I said in the previous video, that much of Ezekiel's prophecy in many ways, it inspired um, a lot of images in the book of Revelation. Well, his prophecy also looks back to the book of Exodus and the book of Leviticus. So in this video, in a special way, we're going to look back at the book of Exodus. And it's really amazing when you see how previous books inspire books that, are, that come after them. And then later on, centuries later, how another book like the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, could look back at Ezekiel and draw from many of the images in Ezekiel. You really see something beautiful about biblical narrative and how the Holy Spirit works throughout history, salvation history, that is. So let's go to Ezekiel chapter 6. We're looking at the RSV translation, and it says, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man. Now, this phrase is used 99 times in the book of Ezekiel. It's a common way of designating this human being, Ezekiel. Son of man, set your face toward the mountains of Israel and prophesy against them. Now, the concept of setting his face towards the mountains and prophesying against them, you know this is going to be negative. And you see a similar image in chapter 4. And it says in verse 3, And say, you mountains of Israel, hear the word, hear, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains and hills, to the ravines and valleys, Behold, I, even I, will bring a sword upon you. I will destroy your high places. Now, What's going on here? Well, to make a long story short, the high places were places where shrines were built. And it's very interesting that you have the ravines and the high places that are kind of juxtaposed against each other. And so they're contrasted. So in the high places, you had shrines possibly to various forms of Baal worship. And then in the valleys in ravines, you also had uh, places of pagan worship as well, to make a long story short. Uh, and so the prophet is prophesying against all of these false religious shrines in the mountains, the hills, the valleys, the ravines. And the Lord himself is saying, I will destroy these high places personally. He will destroy them. Okay. And so we're going to talk about this a little bit more when we get into the notes because it was actually King Solomon who offered sacrifice in high places 
when the Lord gave him that great promise that he would have wisdom and understanding. And that was before the temple was built. But once the temple was built, there was an act of attempting to centralize all worship in Jerusalem. And so what happened is many of these places of, you could say, where the ancestors once worshipped, were converted into shrines of idolatrous worship. And so if you want more examples, you can look at my videos on the prophet Hosea and also Amos, and I get into more detail uh, with that as well. So let's, take, let's go to verse four. It says, your altars shall become desolate. Your incense altars shall be broken. I will cast down your slain before your idols. Now notice how you have the image of slain bodies before idols. It's kind of like this is the ultimate way for God to show them that their worship of false gods is useless, not only useless, but it is a deadly sin. Verse 5, and I will lay the dead bodies of the people of Israel before their idols, and I will scatter your bones round about your altars. Wherever you dwell, your city shall be waste and your high places ruined, so that your altars will be waste and ruined. Your idols broken and destroyed, your incense altars cut down, and your works wiped out. Verse 7, and the slain shall fall in the midst of you, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now this phrase uh, in the concept of knowing that Yahweh uh, you know, is God or, or knowing Yahweh, this phrase kind of repeats three times in chapter six. And what's important about this phrase, we're gonna look at this a little bit. In the Exodus, there were kind of two ways of knowing the Lord. One was through an act of salvation and entering into the covenant relationship and faithfully keeping that covenant. The other was through opposition to the Lord as the Pharaoh and his army opposed the Lord. The people of Egypt came to know that Yahweh was Lord when their Pharaoh and army were destroyed. Uh, so one through an act of salvation and covenant faithfulness, another through an act of judgment because of disobedience. And so what's amazing here is that in the Exodus, when the Lord brought Israel out of its slavery, they came to know the Lord through an act of salvation. But now, if you look closely here, the Exodus is being reversed. The tables are being turned. Because the Lord's people have abandoned their covenant relationship, they've worshiped these false gods, they even sacrificed these children to these false gods, now they're going to know the Lord when an act of judgment comes upon them. And it says in verse 8, I will leave some of you alive. And what's beautiful about this is the image of the holy remnant. A remnant will be left alive and they will return. This is a theme that you have in prophetic literature. It's not just here, but throughout prophetic literature. The concept of a holy remnant returning to Jerusalem and an act of restoration taking place. And it goes on and says, when you, uh, when you have among the nations some who escape the sword, when you are scattered through the countries, then those of you who escape will remember me among the nations where they are, they are carried captive. Now, these words, you, you always have to look at the context. So Ezekiel is preaching to those who are in exile. OK, he's preaching the, to those who have been taken captive and there hasn't been much conversion happening there. And here he is preaching about how the city of Jerusalem will be utterly destroyed. And then those who are who are taken captive, those those that very small group, that very small remnant, they will remember the Lord. In other words, through the exile experience, a, a work of conversion will take place. Something similar can happen in our own lives when we suffer or go through great suffering. There's a often a work of conversion that takes place. You see it all the time. Somebody loses a loved one and then they, they start to come back to church or they lose all their finances. They lose their, their job, their home, and then they suddenly 
begin to give their life to our Lord, they, they begin to see how important the faith is, how it is the absolute most important thing in this life. And our relationship with the Lord, the absolute most important thing that we have at the moment of loss, at the moment of loss. And so, you know, in a similar way, when you encounter people who are going through, you know, a difficult moment in their life, you can you can pray with them. You can invite them back to church. You can walk with them and begin to help them to know the faith so they can know our Lord. And so this is beautiful here. The concept of a, of a remnant returning is throughout the chapter. So you have bad news mixed with good news, okay? And it goes on and it's it talks about how they have blinded eyes. Ezekiel's looking especially at the spiritual blindness of the people. And this is another major theme, especially in the book of Isaiah. If you go to the prophecy of Isaiah, this concept of spiritual blindness comes up again and again. It's the anointed figure in Isaiah 61 who will heal those who have been spiritually blind. If you want a good example, go to Isaiah 61. And so now let's go to verse 10. It says, they shall know that I am the Lord. Notice how the concept is repeated again. For thus says the Lord God, clap your hands and stamp your foot and say, at last. And so what's really cool here is that notice how the prophet is doing this action. He's going to, he's going to start clapping his hands and stamping his foot and saying, at last because of all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword. Notice the, the three chastisements, the sword by famine. Okay. And what's the third one by pestilence, pestilence or disease. So war, famine, and pestilence, those three forms of chastisement for sin. And so what's, what a lot of scholars will point at is notice how the prophet is doing this action, clapping his hands and stomping his feet and yelling out, alas, because of all the evil abominations. And here he is 700 miles away from Jerusalem. He's with the exile, those who have been exiled. And among them are many priests. And Ezekiel is a priest and a prophet, by the way. And so you can just imagine them all watching Ezekiel. And, and not understanding that 700 miles away, the city of Jerusalem would be destroyed about five years after this prophecy, okay? And most of the people would be killed, a few would be taken into exile, and a very small remnant would survive, go through the exile of 70 years, and then come back. So in verse 12, it says, he that is far off shall die of pestilence, and he that is near shall fall by the sword. And he that is left and is preserved shall die of famine. Thus I will spend my fury upon them. And I talked about this in chapter five, the concept of the Lord's wrath having to be completely spent against his people. Now, this is probably one of the most uncomfortable verses right here in chapter 6, when the Lord himself says, I will spend my fury, my wrath, upon, you know, upon them or against them. And so what's comforting about this is just to think about the cross for one second and to consider Jesus dying on the cross and suffering for us. And so when you read verses like this, which are some of the most difficult verses in the prophecy of Ezekiel, 600 years before the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ and his glorious resurrection, it really should cause us, when we think of that concept of fury and judgment, to just meditate on the cross and to really ask ourselves, are we truly grateful for what the Lord has done? And so he, so here it says, Thus I will spend my fury upon them, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So you can just imagine all the exiles, you know, listening to Ezekiel, clapping his hands and stomping his foot and thinking, and we're going to know that Yahweh is the Lord. 
you know, and that, that he is Lord when this act of judgment comes upon them. Obviously, they would have thought back to the Exodus, and we'll talk about that in a second. And it says their slain lie among their idols. Notice the association between the dead and the idols together. Uh, it's underlining worshiping false gods is a deadly sin about their altars upon every high hill and all the mountaintops under every green tree. And so it goes on, it says in verse 14, and I will stretch out my hand against them. This is how the Lord spoke about, you know, about fighting against the Egyptians. Now he's going to enter into an act of judgment against his people and make the land desolate and waste throughout all their habitations from the wilderness of Ribla. Scholars are not sure where, where Ribla is located. Some say among the Moabites or in the Arabian desert. And then it finishes with these words, then they will know that I am the Lord. So the concept of knowing the Lord here, it's associated with an act of judgment. It reminds us of how the Lord and his judgment fell upon the Egyptians. Now let's talk about this a little bit. So we talked about the high places, okay? And if you go back to 1 Kings chapter 3, you'll see that Solomon was actually legitimately offering sacrifices in the high places, but that was before the temple was constructed. And so after the temple was constructed, the temple became the exclusive place of worship, okay? No more sacrifice in high places. Well, what happened? All these former shrines were turned into idolatrous shrines, places where false gods were worshiped. And so in 2 Samuel 7, 10, verse 16, the Lord speaks of the house that David's son will build. That's the temple that Solomon would build and dedicate. And that dedication or consecration ceremony happens in 1 Kings chapter 8, okay? However, these places of former worship were converted over centuries into worship of false gods. So you'll see this in Hosea chapter 4, verse 13, Jeremiah 2.20, and so forth. Okay, um, and so the sin of idolatry would be revealed in its fullest context, and the city would be scattered with dead. So what had happened in Jerusalem, we're going to get a, a, a tour of the city of Jerusalem in, in Ezekiel chapters 8, 9, especially, and it's it's got to be one of the most difficult tours to go on, but when, I don't want to you know, go too much into detail, but chapter eight, especially in chapter nine, will underline how bad the worship of false gods is, that even in the temple area, they were worshiping false gods in the temple courts and so forth. And also how child sacrifice had become institutionalized under some of the former kings of Judah and Jerusalem. So those living in, in Judah would know the Lord, but through an act of judgment. And this is an Exodus theme right here. They had rebelled against the Lord, and because they had rebelled against his covenant, they would know the Lord through an act of judgment. But on a positive note, the Lord tells us that a small remnant will escape to the nations, and while they're in exile, they will they will they will turn from their sin there will be an act of conversion and they will return to the land isn't that beautiful to imagine the concept of a small remnant is an important theme in the prophetic literature and you know the way i would explain it is there are, are sometimes moments where when we look at our own culture we look at how bad things are in our world and sometimes people get really distressed and what I like to encourage them with is remember the small remnant that was always faithful to the Lord and returned after the exile. May we be part of a, even if it is a small remnant, a faithful remnant to the Lord, even in the midst of great apostasy that's all around us. Uh, and so 
I want to go down just a little bit here and talk about the Exodus imagery. The Lord says, I will stretch out my hand upon them. And this reminds us of how the Lord judged the Pharaoh. So if you go to the book of Exodus, the Lord promised to fight for Israel with an outstretched arm. And he said that the people of Israel, you to them, you will know that I am the Lord. Okay. And, and so, wow, this is good right here. We're going to know that Yahweh, you know, that Yahweh is Lord, or, or you're going to know Yahweh through an act of salvation when he fights against our enemies with an outstretched arm. But now, because his own people, God is so fair, God is so fair, when his own people have violated the covenant generation after generation after generation, judgment didn't come right away. It took generations and many prophets who were rejected. Finally, the Lord says that he will stretch out his hand against his people and his judgment will come upon them. So let's look at a couple verses in the book of Exodus. OK, so I just want to uh, take a look at a few verses. The first one is from Exodus chapter six, verses six through seven. OK, and let's see how this is expressed just to get a, a better idea. So in Exodus chapter six, it says uh, to Moses, say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment, and I will take you for my own people. This is marriage imagery right here. It's likening the covenant to a sacred marriage, by the way. And I will take you for my own people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Now, that's a, that's knowing the Lord through an act of salvation and entering into a covenant relationship and knowing him through that beautiful covenant relationship. However, my brothers and sisters, what happens when the covenant is violated and broken and rejected and apostasy begins to reign instead of the covenant? What happens after generations and generations when the Lord sends one prophet after another after another? A lot of times people don't realize how long it took for judgment to come, okay? And so these verses speak of knowing the Lord through salvific action. OK, yet only a few verses later in Exodus, Exodus 7, 17, the concept is repeated, but in reference to the first plague, when the waters of the Nile will become as blood. And then in Exodus 14, 18, we are told that the Egyptians will know that Yahweh is Lord when he fights victorious against the Pharaoh and his army. So they're standing on the shores of the Red Sea. The Pharaoh is charging towards them. And in chapter 14, Moses says, Fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. Notice this is salvation. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be still. Oh, those are beautiful words. And it goes on and it says in verse 18, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And so do you see how what I'm trying to explain here is that for Israel in the Exodus, they knew the Lord through an act of salvation. But the Egyptians knew the Lord when his judgment came upon Pharaoh and his army. And so the point of chapter 6 is now the tables are turned because the Lord's people have rejected their covenant, because they have committed such grave apostasy, because they have ignored all the prophets that the Lord has sent to them, nothing is left but an act of judgment to bring about the conversion of a small remnant. And so as we consider this chapter, we might look at our own life of faith and maybe examine our own lives and, and ask, you know, what needs to change so that I can truly, sincerely walk with the Lord and in honesty say that I know him. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.